Hello everyone, welcome back to another BGCSE past paper review. Now today we are reviewing a physics paper, specifically a paper 2, and this is from the year 2020. Now again, before you start this examination, write your school number, write your candidate number, write your surname and your initials. Before you start the examination, read through the instructions carefully. Ensure that if you have any questions, ask your questions before the examination begins. And again, do not open the booklet until you are told to do so. Now let's jump into our first question. And this statement, it reads that figure 1.1 shows a simplified diagram of a mount design for moving a 0.75 kilogram camera smoothly over short vertical distances. Now, it states, when in operation, the camera is placed between a pair of sliding rails of negligible weight and hung from a spring. The unloaded length of the spring is 2 centimeters. Let's make a note right here. The camera mass is 0 0.75 kg, just to make a note of that. Again, the unloaded spring length is 2 centimeters. What this means is that when nothing is hanging on the spring, the original length or the unstretched spring is 2 centimeters. Now let's get into the question. And let's go to the first part of the question right here. Now we said calculate the weight of the camera if the gravitational field strength acting on it is 10 newtons per kilogram. Now we have something right here. This is a massive camera to remind you right here. And so to find the weight of the camera, just to quickly remind you that weight is equal to mass times gravity. Okay, so let's put that in real quick. So weight is equal to mass times gravity. So our weight here will equal to our mass, which is 0 0.75 multiplied by 10, because 10 is the gravitational field strength. And so the weight of the camera will be 7.5 newtons. All right, so that's our first part of our question out of the way. That's two marks. Now, let's go to our part two of this question here. It says, state two property differences between mass and weight. Now, how do you do this? Now, here's the thing in the exam. I love to do this in examination. They ask for differences. Make a line down the page like that. Use a ruler, make it look nice and straight. Okay? And so what you can do on one side, you can put mass on this side. Uh, just to make life easier for you and also the persons who for also the person who mark in the exam. And so put weight on this side. And let's talk about the differences now. Okay, so one major difference right here, the first difference that I'm gonna talk about is that mass remains the same. The mass remains the same. Okay, great. And so for weight now, weight will change due to gravity. So weight change due to gravity, okay, or based up on gravity. All right. So just to make a note right there. All right. So the next difference, matter of fact, let me put an asterisk. You could put um, bullet points, whatever you choose, just to make sure that you're showing the difference. So that's number one. You can put even number one, number two, A, B, C, whatever you choose. Now let's get into the next difference right here. Now for... Uh, in terms of property, right, mass is a scalar quantity. So mass is scalar, while weight is a vector quantity. Okay, so this is a vector quantity. All right, just to make a note right there. Now, uh, uh oh, okay, all right, great. All right, awesome. Now, just quickly, let me explain this real quick is that what you mean by scalar, scalar mean it has only size or what they call magnitude, okay? So in this, there is only what? Magnitude. It so only has magnitude, okay? All right, just to make it known, magnitude. All right, so great. And so now vector quantity means that it has both, okay? So it has both um, size, which is magnitude, Okay, so magnitude, magnitude, and direction, okay? All right, so awesome. So again, being vector means it has both magnitude and direction, and scalar means only magnitude or size. All right, so 
let's jump to the next part of the question right here. And in this part of the question, it said, when, when the camera is suspended from the spring, it has a new length of five centimeters. It said, what is the extension? Remember the original length of the spring. Of the spring. Let's go back to it, right? The original length of the spring is two centimeters. But now, when something is on it, when the camera is placed on it, then it now moves to five centimeters. That means the spring has stretched. So it moves from five to, it moves from two to five. So therefore we're going to say five minus two, okay, which gives us three centimeters. So the extension here is three centimeters. All right, let's go to part two. In part two, we said how much force is needed to produce an extension of 4.5 um, centimeters. Now, let's quickly do a calculation here. Let's remind of the formula that you need to use for this. Now, remember that force is equal to extension, the constant, a matter of fact, multiplied by extension, okay? And so, we can now make the extension be the subject of the formula, okay? Because we want to find um, the extension. But before you do that, we need to know what is the constant of the spring, how can we find the constant of the spring? It's kind of easy because, listen, we have the extension up here when the, whenever the camera was added to it. And we also have something that is very important. We also have the weight of the camera, okay? And so the weight of the camera is the same thing as force. So let's go back to it. The weight of the camera that we calculated in the first part is 7.5 Newton. That is the weight, which is also a force. So let's put that there as our force. So let's make this quick on this side here. So what I'm going to find out is the, is the extension, um, the constant, a matter of fact. I'm put a line right here to show you my rough working first. So what I want to do here is to determine what my extension is. I already know my force because remember that force, just to put this here, force equals to 7.5 newtons. And that is the force of the camera. Same thing as the weight. All right. And we also know what the extension is when the camera was placed on it. So the extension is um, three centimeters, okay? And so from this, we could find our constant by dividing the force by the extension, okay? So our constant now will be, the constant will be our force, which is um, our 7.5, 7.5 divided by three. And so we get our constant to be 2.5, okay? All right, great. So 2.5 Newton per centimeter, which means for every um, Newton, it will increase by 2.5 centimeters. All right, so that is kind of a rough work situation to show you how to find our constant. Let's now go to the question. Now, the constant is what will maintain throughout the entire stretching of the spring as long as the elastic limit is not reached. Now, let's do something here. This is where the magic start. Now, we want to find force when the extension is 4.5, right? So to find force, again, force is equal to the constant that we established right here, which is 2.5, multiply by the extension. So guess what? Let's put our force in. So force equals to our constant, which is 2.5, okay? Multiply that now by the extension that we know now are given, which is 4.5, okay? And so that will give us now a value of 11.25. 5 newtons. All right, excellent. Now, let's move on to the next question. Again, you can pause and review that to make sure you understand what I, um, what I did. All right, but let's jump to the next question here. Now, for part C1, it said, on the axis below, sketch a graph that you should expect for the spring in figure 1.1 before it reaches its elastic limit. Label this section AB. So before the spring reaches elastic limit, we're going to draw a line. Remember now um, that extension and force are proportional. Hopefully, I could draw a very straight line here, but if it's not too straight, please forgive me, but I'm going to try my very best. Wow, I got it. All right, it's not perfect straight, but yeah, I could work with that. All right, usually I can't draw a straight line. But anyways, um... This it asks us to label this AB. So let's label this piece AB right here. So this is known as AB. So this line is our AB line. Okay, I want to get into this to make sure it could work. Uh-oh. Come on. All right. AB. 
Okay, great. Now, it hacks us now. Let's go back to the next part of the question below. So that will be your straight line because both of them are proportional. And it said, on the graph drawn in C1, which is what we just did, sketch a section that shows the spring beyond its elastic limit. Label that part BC. Now, there's something I need to show you right here before I, I, I move on. Now, what you need to focus on is that, hey, the extension is on the y-axis. The force is on the x, right? So, the way this will look, matter of fact, let me get in a different color to draw this. So let's put this in probably blue. How this will appear is that starting from this point, let's say the elastic limit is here. So, the line will start to be curvy and start looking different. So, it not be proportional anymore. So, it's no longer proportional. So, it start going that way. Now, we need to label this BC. Okay, so let's label this piece here BC. Uh, let's put a different color there. All right, let's put this one here. So this is now BC, which is now the point where the elastic limit is reached. So after this red spot, elastic limit is reached. The, the, the spring is no longer obeying Oak's law. Okay, so there's no more proportionality. Now, just to point this out, what if in the examination, your graph was drawn differently in terms of the axis labels, right? And so let's say you have force on this side over this side here on the y-axis and extension was on the x. Now the graph would, would turn a different way. Just to point it out real quick, right? Okay, so let's point this out real quick. All right, so how this graph will look differently than the one that's shown on the right, just because of a change in, in the labelings of the axis, then this graph will come like this this way and then you'll have a curve this way. You see what I'm saying? So please just make a note of that. Pay attention to... Um, how they label the graphs, or if they ask you to label the graph a particular way, then you know exactly what to do. All right, so let's jump to the next question here. All right, and so we're going into question number two. Now, for this question, is about forces and momentum. All right, so forces and momentum. So figure 2.1 shows a man throwing a bowling ball of mass 7.2 kilograms with a starting speed of 6.25 meters per second. All right. So again, just let, let's quickly highlight these things that are very important to us. The mass of the ball, so, so the ball of mass right here is 7.2 kg. And importantly, the starting speed, not just the speed, but the what? Starting speed is 6.25 meters per second. That may be important, right? Now, let's go, go into the question here now. So calculate the initial momentum. Calculate the initial momentum um, of the ball. And remember now, this refers to the starting speed. But before I go into that, let's talk about the, the formula for momentum. So let's quickly put that in. So the formula for momentum, I'm going to write this in for a reason. Uh, to let my P kind of shape um, a little bit um, like the momentum formula. So it's equal to um, the mass here multiplied by the velocity, okay? All right, so great. That's the momentum formula right there, mass times velocity. So we have our mass. Let's go back to our question. Our mass there is 7.2, and our starting um, speed here is 6.25. So therefore, our momentum, which is mass times the velocity, must be uh, 7. 0.2, okay, multiplied by, um, let me just ch change this back to, to blue, make it easier for us to see. All right, multiply by 6.25, and that will give us uh, 45, so that is 45 kilograms meters per second. Okay, so that is our initial momentum. All right, awesome. Now, let's go to the next part of the question here. And the next part of the question, it reads, what would be the effect on momentum if the same ball was bowled with a greater initial starting speed? So let's think about this. Let's go back to the formula. If the speed is greater, you're multiplying this 7.2 by a greater speed, then naturally get a bigger number, right? So if the number is bigger, it therefore means that the momentum will what? Increase, okay? So what would be the effect on momentum? That means momentum will increase, okay? Momentum, all right, will increase, all right? Just to make a note of that. Awesome. Now, let's go to the next part of the question right here. It said, describe the motion of the ball along the lane 
when the horizontal force acting on it is uh, on it are balanced. So once the um, horizontal forces are balanced, what will happen to the motion of the ball? Now, first and foremost, it therefore means the ball is in equilibrium, which means the forward force and the backward force are equal. The ball is on a slope, which is a good thing. So it therefore means the ball will continue rolling, but since there is no external force acting, the ball will continue with that motion. Remember, Newton's first law of motion. Uh, motion. That means if an object at rest will stay at rest, but if an object is moving, it will continue to move with a constant speed as long as no external force is acting on it. So if the horizontal forces are balanced, therefore mean the ball will move with constant what? Speed. Okay, so it will move uh it will move uh oh with constant speed okay all right so the speed will be constant so it will move with constant speed the motion will be constant all right so let's jump to the next part of the question right here the next part of the question right here is a figure 2.2 shows the forces acting on the 7.2 kg ball as it moves along the bowling lane which is not level all right. So it is not level. That's not even important to us right now. But it shows two different forces, yeah? Now, the two different forces that are shown right here is one, two newton going that way, which is backwards, and then 15 newton going that way. And so what is important, we know that there will be a resultant force. What is this resultant force? They go in two different directions. Therefore means the resultant force will go in the direction of the greater force, which is that direction, but will be the differences between two between these two forces, right? That's very important to note. So therefore, we can say the difference between 15 and 2 is 13. So we can establish that the ball will go forward with 13 newtons. But let's go to the question to see what the question actually asks us to do, right? Okay, so let's jump to the question. And the question now said, what is the acceleration of a ball when the force is 15 newtons is applied if two newton of friction acts against it okay so we already established what the new force will be which is 30 newtons so therefore we can go ahead now and find our acceleration but please remember that the formula for force is equal to mass times acceleration yep and so if force is equal to mass times acceleration then we can establish that acceleration is equal to force divided by mass all right so now we have that. Now let's apply our information to this. The force is um, 30 newtons. So it's 30 newtons divided by the mass of the ball. And the ball mass here, let's go back to the question to make sure we remind you about it. The mass here is 7.2 kg. Okay. So we're going to divide now that force by what? 7.2 kg. All right. And so the answer here is... 1.81 meters per second squared. Meters per second squared. Right, unfortunately, I can't be able to type that um, superscript too, so I'm going to do that. All right. So, excellent. Uh, great. So, now let's go to the next question here. It said, what is the relationship between the rate of change, of the rate of change in momentum of a body and the force applied. Let's think about it. Momentum and force. Now remember the formula for momentum, right? Just quick, put, quickly put it right here so you will see what I'm talking about, right? The formula for momentum, let me just put a P right there. Um, not the exact font size I'm using, but yeah, it will work, or the type of font. So it's mass times velocity. That's most important. Momentum is equal to mass times what? Um, velocity, cool? But that's not only important. Remember also that force is equal to mass times acceleration, right? So if you, if you divide mass um, times velocity by time, you get our force. So therefore, if the force is increased, then the momentum must also what? Increase. All right, so these two formulas are related with the difference in time. Time makes a difference between um, these two formulas. Um, so, so force, momentum. Mass times velocity, mass times acceleration. So if you, if you divide uh, momentum by time, you get force. Okay, so they are proportional. So again, as force increases, momentum will increase. And because they are what? 
proportion. So what is the relationship? Is that they are what? Proportional. All right, just to make a note of that. So as one increases, the next one increases. Okay, just to make a note and you can write that down. And so the last part of this question is to give, al give an alternative unit for the kilogram meter per second. This is a very interesting question right here, right? Now, the fact of the matter is, let's think about this. Kilogram meter per second, what is that unit? So let's put it on the side right here um, to make life easier for us because I want to demonstrate something to you. Matter of fact, I could put it at the bottom. So first thing, what gives us um, kilograms, meters per second? If you go back to the formula right here, right? Kilogram meter per second, this is momentum, okay? That's momentum. So if you think about um, the force formula, let's think, if, let's think about even the force formula right here, right? So another formula, the force formula, which is this one, we could have mass, which is kilograms, okay? So we could have kilograms here. We could have kilograms, meters per second squared. So meters per second squared. Let's put, let's put the squared on that one. And so this is a force formula right here. I'm going to show you a little thing right here now. Okay. So what can you do now? Because this, again, is momentum. All right. This is momentum. We don't want to do that because this is already in the original unit. But what can I do with this one to make it become this? So that's my objective, right? I want the kilogram meters per second squared become kilogram meter per second. So what I'm going to do here is simple this. I, I'm going to multiply, I'm going to multiply this unit here, all right, by time. So if I multiply by second, which is time, then what will happen here is that one of this, this S will cancel one of the S, which will leave you with kilogram meter per second. So what I will do now is to, is to classify this the segment of this equation because this piece here is force and this piece here is time. So if I multiply force by time, right, what I will get, I will get kilograms, okay, meters per second because, because I multiply by that second, it, it cancels one of that second. So technically, force multiplied by time is the same thing as kilogram meters per second. But guess what? They ask for a different unit. How are we going to get this unit? Do you remember that force is measured in what? Newton. So this is in Newtons right here. And time is measured by what? Seconds. So if I multiply Newton by second, my unit now would be what? Newton second. So Newton second is the alternative unit, okay? That's a way to break it down. All right, let's jump into the next question now. And the next question right here is that this question is about changes of state of density. Now, what is interesting with this question is that 200 gram of solid substance x a solid substance x is heated from a temperature of 30 degrees celsius to 120 degrees celsius figure 3.1 shows the heating curve for this substance now let's go to the graph a little bit so we could see the graph and analyze the graph better so here nice and easy right there so on the y-axis we have our temperature and on the x-axis we have our time before i do anything before i do anything let's just break this graph down because i want you to understand this a matter of fact let me drop my fun size a little bit as well because i'm going to make this fit on this graph so from the 30 degrees celsius which is right here all the way up here it is solid because remember now this substance started what solid they say it was a what solid so to confirmation let's go back into the question see 200 grams of what? Solid substance. And let's highlight that because I should highlight that to motherfucking the first way to begin, yeah? So it's a solid substance. It is at 30 degrees. So at 30 degrees, it is a solid. However, it moves to 120 degrees. We need to figure out what happened along the way. So let's go back here. Again, it is a solid substance at 30 degrees Celsius all the way up to this point. So there's something happening here. After this point, then... The solid will start to change in state. So what's going to happen is a process called melting. Solid will start to what? Melt. So melting taking place right there. 
and then after melting is finished, then the entire solid will become what? Liquid. So this phase right here will be a liquid phase, okay? So let's put our liquid phase right here. So this will be liquid. All right, and after liquid, then what will happen to liquid is that the liquid will start to what? Boil. So on this phase here where this line is flattened or plateauing, boiling will take place. When a, liquid, when a liquid boils, then it eventually turns to gas. So this slope going up here will be a gas. Now I want to point out something to you real quick, right? Once a line is sloped for a cooling curve or a heating curve, there is no change in state, just to make a note of that. Okay, so the entire um, slope here is solid, the entire slope here is liquid, the entire slope here is gas. And the processes are in between, from solid to liquid melting. From liquid to, 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 to gas, it's going to be what? Boiling. Now, I want to show you something again, but I want to put this into a different font, so it'll be kind of easier for you to recognize what I'm doing here. And let me point this out real quick. So, in melting, what is taking place in melting is that the solid is changing to liquid. So, where is melting is taking place, the solid will go to what? Liquid. Just to make a note of that. And then now, when you had the boiling, then the liquid will turn to what? Gas. Okay? So, that's where the change of state is taking place. Liquid to gas. Just to make a note. All right. Now, we establish that. We can actually jump to a graph, to a questions now, and kind of figure out what the questions are asking us and see if we can apply them. But before I even go further, let us point out a few things right here as well, right? Because it's very important for you to know these things. What I always want you to do, if, well, needs be, you need to know this, is that the first thing to do is to check your graph in terms of the scaling, right? Especially when you use numbers. And so let me use my pen. So here is one, two, three, four lines. So from 20 to 40, that's four lines. That's a y-axis scale. So from 20 to 40 is 20 jumps, right? So there's 20 points. So we're counting for 20 points. I just want to show you this real quick. The, the lines that fall between is four lines. So that's four lines there. And so we can know that each line now will equal to five, okay? So 20 divided by four, we get five. So each of these smaller lines, they are equated to what? Five values. Okay, let's do the same thing for our um, x-axis. One, two, three, four, five lines between each number, and each number has a value of one. So what we can see for the, for the x-axis is one divided by um, five, because there's five lines there. And so here our scale will be each of those smaller lines will, uh, will have a value of 0 0.2. Okay? All right, so great. We established the scales, which is excellent because you may need those, I tell you. All right, let's now go to the question here now, right? Is a state the melting point and boiling point and boiling points for substance X? So melting and boiling. So let's go to the graph now. Remember I tell you this, right? That we have the melting of the boiling. All right, so that's kind of easy for us now. So what we're going to do is jump into this and look at where the melting point is. Let's put, uh, a, yeah, let's use red for this. All right, and so the melting point will come on this line. So I'm going to try to go as straight as possible over to this line. That's the melting point. Let's put um, MP right here to so kind of remind us what is that. And let's go to the boiling point. It's going to come on this line where it starts to boil. So that's where it's initial boiling taking place. That's the boiling point. Uh oh, this line is not so straight, but you see that you get the drift right there. So this is the boiling point. Let's call it BP. Okay. All right. So I want to find out the, the, the value of our melting and boiling point. Remember, each line is by 5. So this is 45, 50, and then this will be what? 55. So our, our melting point is 55. And our boiling point now, this is 80, 85, 90. So this is 55 and 90, respectively. So let's jump into and answer a question now. Again, our melting point is 55, uh, let me change that into blue. I really want to see this properly. So 55 degrees Celsius. All right, so unfortunately, I cannot write in my um, subscript um, degrees. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to write in just a moment. And then this will be our 90 degrees Celsius, okay? 90 degrees Celsius. 
And so let's quickly draw that in. All right. I'm just put it in red. It don't really matter. Okay. Just for you to know. Okay. That's degree Celsius there. Okay. All right. Great. So that's our melting and boiling point respectively. Now with the next question said, what state of matter is present when the temperature is 50 degrees? Let's go back to our graph. You see these numbers now are very important. 50 degrees is, uh, let's mark that point off, is each line is, is, each line is, a f is 5, right? So the 50 will be um, right here. So 45, 50. So this is 50. And if you go across, it is still a solid, yeah? Because this point right here is still a solid. It's on this um, slope. So it's still solid. So here it is solid. All right. So this is solid. Solid as a rock. All right. So part three. How long did substance X exist entirely as a liquid during the heating so let's check that now right how long it stays as a liquid right so let's look where the liquid starts right here okay and so here now uh liquid starts here let's go to my pen let's put a different color here just not to mess up everything but the liquid starts here all right i'm gonna start it right here go all the way down to this line okay and then liquid ends at this big line right at the 5, right? So you, this one is bold, so you could actually see it. I'm going to go down still with it. So liquid ends right here. So from here to here. But let's figure out what values they are. Because remember again, each of these smaller lines on the axis um, has a value of 0 0.2. So therefore, this is 3.2 right here. And this is 5, right? So between 3.2 and 5, it remains entirely a what? liquid so let's go into that now answer that question so between five so we're going to say five here minus uh the 3.2 right that was 3.2 um yes so 3.2 minus 3.2 and then you're going to give us here now one point what eight so 1.8 um and the graph is in minutes so this 1.8 minutes okay so 1.8 minutes, that is a timing. Or we could convert this into minutes and seconds. So, or we could st state this in um, one minute, okay? One minute and also 48 seconds. So that's 48 seconds. 0.8 multiplied by 6 is 48, right? Okay, so 0.8 multiplied by 6 is 48. So 48 seconds. So if you want to label it like that, you also could go ahead and do it like that, right? But 1.8 minutes is fine because that's the um, labeling on the graph. Now for part B, it said, what is happening to kinetic energy, right, of the particles of substance X between 5 and 6.4 minutes? Now, let me jump into this. So we're looking for 5 and 6.4. So let's see where 5 is. Okay, so 5 is right here and 6.4 is right here. So we're talking about, um, let me just use, matter of fact, let me just highlight this. So it's talking about from here. All right, that will not be able to happen. So yeah, I could take it from here maybe. Uh, let's see. No. Okay. Uh, let me mark it. Uh, let's give it a different color. Okay. So let's mark it with uh, blue maybe. Perfect. Okay. So I'm going to start from right here. So this is 6.4 um, that the axis is for all the way to 5. That straight line is a straight line, right? Now, if it is a straight line, look at the y-axis. There's no change in temperature. Temperature remains the same, right? So there's something I want to remind you about, and it's about the kinetic theory of matter, right? And the kinetic theory, which states that now that temperature, right, is proportional to kinetic energy, which means then if temperature increases, kinetic energy will also increase. So it therefore means if there is no change in temperature, that means there is no change in kinetic energy. Okay? So therefore means that the kinetic energy here will remain the same because there is no change in temperature. And you could explain that, right? So this remains the what? The kinetic energy remains the same. Uh, let me just put it in short. Please write out it in examination. I must put in KE for short. The kinetic energy um, remains the same. All right, you can write it out. I'm just trying to save some time here. Okay, and the reason for that is because, again, kinetic energy is proportional to what? Temperature. If temperature remains the same, kinetic energy remains the same. Okay, however, I may want to put this in. However, 
there will be a gain in potential energy. Okay, so when there is um, no temperature change and there is no kinetic energy change, then there's a gain in potential energy. Just to make a note of that, because heat is still there, so there's a gain in potential energy. So you can make a note of that. Now, say so give a reason for your answer. And the, and, the, and the answer right here is that there's no change in temperature. That's the bottom line, right? Um, the, the temperature remains the same. Okay? The temperature remains the same. And again, it's simply because temperature and kinetic energy, they are proportional. Okay? So I'm going to put it in bracket right here. That Ke, which is kinetic energy, all right, and temperature. Let's do this real short. And temperature. Um are proportional okay they are proportional all right great now once we establish that now let's jump to the next part of the question it said if substance x has a volume of uh 8.5 centimeters cube at seven degrees celsius right at seven degrees celsius what is the density at this temperature we have figure out something is the temperature really important at this point? Maybe, maybe not. But what is important, we know that density, let's write this formula, that density, right, is equal to mass over volume. So M over V. We have our mass of this solid substance, right? Do you remember the question? I could go back to it real quickly. But the mass of the solid, see right here, 200 grams, right? So the mass is 200 grams, right? And the volume here is 8.5 centimeters cubed. The temperature is not really important at this point, right? But it's important now to calculate the density. So for this question, I don't need to, to use the temperature. But the mass, again, is 200 uh, grams. So 200 grams divided by the volume, which is 8.5. And so this now equivalent to 23 Point five uh, three grams per centimeters cube. Okay, let me just write in my uh, my cube. Am um, I unable to do that? So that will be the answer there. All right. So let me um, uh, let's see if I could get into this and make this a little bit bigger as well. Okay, you could see it much better. All right. Let's go up back to uh, yeah, perfect. All right, so unfortunately, I have to move this. All right, so let's try to move it. All right, excellente. All right, great. So here we have it. That's part C right there, part C1. Let's go to part C2. It said, when um, with reference to figure 3.1, at which temperature would the substance X have the greatest density? This is a solid substance. The substance melt. Then it may um, turn to gas. What you need to know about substance, a part of a liquid, and this is true for all liquids except water. When liquids, uh, when substances are at solid, the particles, the particles come closer and therefore means there's a decrease in volume, right? A decrease in volume gives you a great density, okay? When the particles are spread out, the volume increases and hence you have a lower, smaller density. So let's go here. And see where the liquid, the substance start. And it start at um, 30 degrees, right? So this is 30 degrees right here. And so at this point, is a, it is a solid, right? This is a solid right here, which means the particles are really, really close, which means there is a small volume, okay? Not taking up a lot of space compared to liquid and gas, okay? So at um, 30 degrees Celsius, that is where the density is the greatest, simply because the volume is reduced. Again, because the particles lose kinetic energy and they go closer together. So this is 30 degrees Celsius. All right. There we go. All right. So let's jump to the next part of the question. The next part of the question say, what is happening to the kinetic energy of the molecules of substance X when the gradient of the eating curve is steepest? If it is steepest, remember I talk about the steepness. Once there is a slope, let me just draw that. I don't need to go back on the graph. Once there is a slope, that means there is a change in temperature. So once I have a temperature change, right? Once I have a temperature change, uh oh, let me draw it better than that. 
So once there's a temperature change, let me see if I could take that out. Okay, I need this. Uh oh. Okay, let's take both 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 out. Uh okay. Uh let's just delete that. Alright, so let's do this again. Um Again, once you have a temperature change, right? That's a temperature change, a triangle. So once it's a change in, in, in temperature, it equivalents it's equivalent to kinetic energy. Okay? So just to make a note of that. So they are equal. Temperature change is equivalent to kinetic energy. So therefore, if the slope is the greatest, it therefore means that the kinetic energy is the greatest. Okay? All right. So you have the highest kinetic energy or the kinetic energy will increase. So kinetic energy, again, I'm going to do this in short. So kinetic energy um, increase. Okay? And simply because, again, because the change in temperature is equivalent to kinetic energy. Okay? And so also, if you want to make it specific, you can say the kinetic energy is the greatest at that point as well. Okay? All right? Is the greatest at that point. All right. Awesome. All right, so let's jump to the next question here. That was a nice question, though. All right, let's look at this question. That's number four. It said, the, this, it, this question is about simple electronic circuits. And this is, uh, it said, figure 4.1 shows a 6-volt battery. So there's a 6-volt battery there, right, um, connected to a resistor and a component X in series. So both of them are in series. Now, before I go any further in this thing, right, let's just talk a little bit. Uh, let's get into this. Let's just decrease this a little bit so I could get uh, proper writing in this. This is a diode, right? And this part of the diode, the fat part of this diode right here, or the base of a triangle of the diode, if you want to remember it as that, it is always positive. Okay? It is always positive. This line part or the tip of the, the, the triangular part of it in terms of a symbol is always negative. Okay? Just to make a note. And so the negative point is called the cathode. So let's make a note right there. The negative part is called the cathode. And the positive part at the positive end is called the anode. Okay? And again, you remember, uh, just remember the ends, positive and negative. Again, this is a diode. All right? Also, I want to point out is that the positive end of the diode it must be connected to the positive part of the battery. So the longer part of, of the battery represent um, positive. The short part represent um, negative. And so here again is a positive part, and this is a negative part. Again, batteries must be connected in what? Series, negative to positive, and so on, all right? Okay, great. So the opposite terminals must be together, and batteries are generally connected in series. They can connect in parallel as well, but the voltage will remain the same if they're in parallel. Just to make a note. All right, that's some extra information, really, yeah? All right. Let's talk about um, the components. Identify the component X and state its function in the circuit. So here now, uh, the name of this is a diode, and the function of this is to allow uh, current to allow, okay, to allow current or charge. You can say to allow current or charge, okay, current or charge to flow in one direction, right? All right, so that's the function of it in the circuit, to allow current or charge to flow in one direction, only in one direction. All right, let's go to the next piece here. It said the potential difference across the 8 ohm resistor is 4.8 volts, all right? It said calculate the potential difference across um, component X. So let's think about this um, a little bit, right? The battery is giving out 6 volts. Okay, let's go to the diagram and talk about it, a matter of fact. All right? Because this is a series circuit here. The battery is giving out six, six volts, but I want to know the voltage across the 8 ohm resistor. That means there's a voltage across this as well, right? And so what I want to point out here is that the total, the total voltage within a series circuit, let's put that in, maybe that will help us. The total voltage, let's put, um, let me write that in. So V, which is the total voltage, is equal to V1 plus V2, okay, plus V3, and so on, right? You continue continuing. So let's put that there. Plus V3, okay, 
continuing, continuing, continuing. All right. So once we establish that, that means the total voltage is what is coming out of the battery. So, the, so, the, so VT for this question is 6 volts, right? So let's think about it in this sense. Um, the total voltage is 6 volts. So let's put our 6 volts right here. Okay. 6 volts. All right. Uh, let me increase this back again. You can see a little bit better. Uh, matter of fact, let me put it into that. So 6 volts is equivalent to, which is a total voltage. Let's say V1. Let's call it the, the, the 8 ohm resistor. Okay. So let's put that as um, 4.5. Um, okay. 4.8, a matter of fact. All right. So that's very important. But it asks us to find the, the potential difference across component X. So let's call component, um, the voltage across that, or the potential difference, let's call it V, okay, or V2. You may want to call it V2. So let's make V be the subject of a formula, right? So V be the subject of a formula. So V now, which is across X, or we could call it Vx if you want, which means the, 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 the potential difference across X. Let's call it Vx, all right? So, so Vx now will be equal to 6, okay? It will equal to 6 minus, right, 4.8, okay, 4.8. And so therefore here, um, this now equals to 1.2 volts. Okay, so the potential difference across component X is 1.2 volts, okay? Uh, let me just put a line down here. I don't want this confusing is one line. Okay, so this is what I use to get the formula here. And this is our calculation. Okay, great. Now let's jump to the next part of the question here. See what is happening here. And this is, it said the circuit in figure 4.1 is now modified with a 16 ohms resistor in parallel as shown in figure 4.2. So now the difference here is that this here is now added, right? Very important. So now it's a parallel circuit, no longer a series circuit, okay? All right, so here now, uh, let's, let's talk about this real quick, all right, and see what the difference here. It said calculate the current in the 6 ohm, uh, calculate the current in the 16 ohm resistor. So going to calculate the, the current in the 16 ohm resistor. So what you need to do, first and foremost, you need to think about something here. How are we going to calculate current? What formula do we have to calculate current? Um, please remember this formula here, right? It's going to help us out a little bit. So voltage, if you remember voltage, is equal to, uh -oh, is equal to I times R, right? Okay, that's, that's a formula to remember. So voltage equal to current times resistor. Because we have voltage, we have resistor, we need to find um, current, right? So how we're going to find it now, we're simply going to say, because remember the voltage, the voltage in a parallel circuit is all the same, right? So let me demonstrate what I'm talking about right here, is that the voltage coming from the battery in a parallel circuit is the same. So let me use my highlighter right here. So the voltage running from here to that um, 8 ohm resistor going all the way around is 6 volts, okay? That is 6 volts going all the way around here. And let me go to... Um, let me go back into a different color and I'm going to show you this in red. So the voltage here, because this is parallel, running inside of the 16 ohm resistor is also 6 volts. So the, you can follow different path because they're different pathways. That means both of them are experiencing the voltage the same exact way. Voltage across each is the same. Okay. All right. So great. Now, um, so the voltage across the 16 ohm resistor is, is 6, all right? And so let's calculate our current at this time. And so if V is equal to I times R, then I must equal to V over R, okay? So therefore here, I is equal to V over R. And so here now, our current here, I, is equal to voltage, which is 6, divided by our resistor, which is 16, makes that 0 0.375, no, 375 amperes. Okay, so that's now our answer. Now right, let's go to part two. But part two is how will the current in the battery compare to that in C1. Um, now what you need to note 
is that current in parallel is a different story, right? Because remember, we did it in series before. So the current in a parallel, let's make a note of that. The current in a parallel, which is I. So I, the total current in a parallel, so say IT here, is equivalent to I1. Okay, I need to take that out. All right. It's, all right. All right. Let's, let's delete this. All right. That's all of that gone. All right, so let's do it over again. So here, um, total current is equal to I1, okay, plus I2, plus I3, and so on, okay? Just to make a note, plus I2, plus I3, and continuing, continuing. That is the current in a parallel. Okay, continue, 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 continue. Now, why did this is to help us to answer the question? Like I said, how will the how will the current in the battery compared to that in um, C1 that we calculate to be 0 0.375? So the current ac across the 16 ohm resistor, which is this, and also the current experienced by the 8 ohm resistor will give you a certain value. We could also divide that, just divide by just divide the 6 by um by, by the 8. Um, you'll get that value. But I'm not really interested in that right now. So the value here will be a low value anyway, because um, it will be a little bit higher than that anyways, right? So you could, you could divide, again, the 6 by the 8, right, to get your, um, your, your, your value. But what is important here is that if all the current within the circuit must give you the total, which is in the battery, the total is coming from the battery, right? Therefore means that whatever is in the battery must be higher than any individual current. Because all those current must add up to what is coming from the battery. So guess what? The current in the battery must be what? Greater. The current in the battery is greater. Okay, so make sure to make a note of that. So the current in the battery is greater. I can say the current um, that is calculated is all the current in the battery is compared to that. And see the current in the battery. Current in the battery is greater. Okay. Very important to note that, all right? And so the current that we calculated above must be less because it plus the current across the 8 ohm resistor must add up to what is in the battery. All right, great. Now, listen to this one now. It said the direction of component X in figure 1.1 is now reversed. You reverse this. It's a state and explain what will happen to the current in the battery, yes? So let's go back to this. It's reversed. As um, so if we reverse this this thing right here, then what will happen here is the scenario will change. In in other words, the positive will connect to the negative part, and so therefore something will go, go wrong with that circuit. In that case, we call it a reverse bias. Okay. So in other words, what will happen here is that no current will flow. Okay. So the first number right here is that no current. So no current um, will flow. And simply put, because um, there will be a barrier, there will be a barrier in the diode. So the diode will create a barrier. I will create a barrier, right? In the diode, all right, um, restricting the flow of current in the diode, all right, restricting the flow of current. Okay. And again, this. Um, in, in this, what is created, we create what they call a reverse bias. So I'm just make a note of that. So this is what they call a reverse um, bias. All right, so great. Now let's jump into the next part of, well, next question, because this question is finished. All right, so you say a person noticed the following label on the side of an electric water eater. So you have um, 120 volts, you have 60 hertz, you have 2,400 watt. Now, the next, the part of the question here said, what does the panel tells us about the eater? So, what this information is saying about the eater. So, notice what we're saying here. What these things are telling us about the eater. Okay? So that's what is happening there. So, anyway, let's go into answering this. And so, if it is 120 volts, it means that the required voltage is 120. Because if you have anything less than that, it will not work effectively. And if you have greater voltage than 120, then the circuit may burn out or the eater may damage. 
So therefore, now the effective um, required in, um, voltage. So the let's write that in and put this a little bit lower so we can have everything fit on the line. The effective required voltage, okay, is one twenty. Okay, it's 120 volts. So that's the effective required voltage. That means for the for the ether to work effectively or its maximum, it requires a voltage of 120. Anything higher will create damage or burn the ether out, may even create fire. Below 120, the ether will not heat properly. Okay. Now, 60 Hertz. Now remember what Hertz is, right? It is one of a period, which is um, telling the amount of cycle. So Earth rep rep um, represent the cycle. So what this is saying now, and cycle is the amount of charge produced per second, right? Just to make a note of that. So here now, to, to make this work effectively, the eta requires, the eta requires 60 column of charges, right? A column of charge, um, column of charge, all right, of charge every second or per second okay per second that means if you're not producing 60 charges 60 column of charges per second the ether will not work effectively so that's the required um frequency or the required charge per second all right and now 2400 watt what 2400 watt means um again wattage is, is rated as power so there's the power rating and so power is the energy used per second. And so it is the amount of energy, which is joule per second as the same unit. So this now, that means it uses, the machine, the ETA will use, so it uses um, 2,400 joule of energy, all right, of energy every second or per second. That's exactly what's going to happen there, yes? So that's the information it, we know about the ether by looking at these um, values. All right, great. Now, part B is a state the energy output every second in kilojoules. Wow. Now, it's a in kilojoules. Now, again, 2,400 watt is the same thing as 2,400 joules per second, right? And it said per second for every second. So all you need to do here is really to remember this. Uh, let me just kind of give it right here instead of going back out and write over that. So 2,400 um, joules or watt then is equivalent to 2,400 joules per second. So the same thing. Just to kind of see where I'm going here, right? So if 2,000 joules per second, all you need to do is to change the joules into kilojoules by dividing by 1,000, right? So I could now divide my 2,400 joules Divide it by a thousand, which will give us kilojoules. Okay, divide by a thousand will equal to two point four. That's two point four, right? Um, kilojoules, kilojoules, right per second, because it said for every second for output every second. That means we have it per second, right? All right, great. That's simple. It's asking that convert into kilojoules per second. All right, great. Now, the next part of the question here now reads that if, if, thus if, if the water eater was used continuously for eight hours, how many kilowatt units, which is a unit of electricity there, um, will be consumed? First and foremost, we know that the kilojoules is the same thing as kilowatt, okay? Okay, so just to make a note right here is that 2.4 kilojoules per second is the same thing as kilowatt. I'm put it up here, matter of fact, right? So uh, let me put it here. It's not, it's not the part of the first question. I mean, if it's there, it's not a problem, really. But um, this is also saying 2.4 kilowatts, right? Kilowatts per second, right? All right. So here now, um, what is important here now, right? It said if the water eater was used, right, continuously for eight for eight hours, right? For eight hours. How many kilowatt hours unit of electricity energy is consumed? All right, what I'm going to show you right here, let's just show you something real quick. So what I'm going to do is to plug in my 2.4 kilowattage of energy that is used, right? 2.4 kilowatts. All right, so that's going to be my kilowatt right there. And then you're going to multiply that by time. 
right? Um, so kilowatt hours, you're gonna multiply that by time here. And so let's put our eight hours there. Let me take that out and let's say 2.4 multiplied by eight. And that will give us there a 2.4 by eight. It is a uh, 19.2. Okay, so 19.2 kilo um, watt hours. So that will be our answer there. All right. So 19.2 kilowatt hours, that will be our energy or electricity consumed. All right, so now jump into the next part of the question here. It said, a unit of electricity costs 15 cents. Calculate the cost of operating the water heater continuously for eight hours. So again now, we, we already calculate the amount that is consumed for eight hours, which is 19.2, but how much is cost now for that eight hours We'll have to multiply one unit, which is um, 19.2. Okay, that's one unit. Multiply by the cost of one unit, which is 15 cents. This will give us now uh, 288 cents. All right, I'm going to write that in. And we could convert that into dollars by, by dividing by 100. So that will also equal to, in terms of dollars, $2.88. Um, cents. So let me draw in this piece right here. So this will be 288 watt cents. All right, great. All right, so let's go to the next part of the question. Now, the next part of the question here reads that a fuse is a safety device found in household electrical circuits. Explain how a fuse rated at 10 amps operates as a safety device. Now, first and foremost, there's a, there's a current rating, which is a 10 amps which means the maximum current that can flow through it without breaking the fuse is 10 amperes. So therefore, the fuse here now, the fuse, okay, the fuse will break. And the reason why the fuse breaks is to protect the circuit. So the fuse will break at current, okay, exceeding 10 amperes, okay? So anything above 10 amperes, the circuit will break. There no more current flowing and the device will be protected. Hopefully there's no damage before that. All right? Okay, great. Now this part of the question here said an electric an, an electric iron rated at 1000 watt, okay, is plugged into a 120 volt outlet. Okay? Calculate the current drawn by the iron and determine if the 10 amp fuse will be blown. So first and foremost here, um, let's look into it. We want to find, um, we have the power, we have the voltage, so we need to find the current. So the formula that contains um, power, voltage, and current is, again, as I remind you, is P is equal to um, IV, which is current times voltage. And so we could go ahead and now and find our current. So our current will be um, power over um, current. And so let's find our current here. Let's put it right here. All right, so I will equal to um, P over V. So this is 1,000 with 1,000 watt divided by 120 volts. So that will give us 8.33 amperes. But the question asks, it said that you'd calculate the current drawn by it and determine if the 10 ampere fuse will be blown. And this is below 10 amperes, so the, so the fuse will not be blown. The fuse will stay intact, okay? So the fuse will not be blown. Yep, it will stay intact. All right, excellent. All right, that's the end of the question. All right, now going to the next question, and this is question number six. We're almost there, yeah? All right, so in this, in this one now, um, the question read that the diagram in figure 6.1 shows a lens, the opposite, um, sorry, the position of an object and the position of the of its image. So here we have the object and here we have the image. So it's a what type of lens is shown in figure 6.1? And because the ends are narrow and the middle is thicker, then this is known as a convex lens. So this is a convex lens. Okay. All right. So it's a what is the name? What is the name of the point labeled P1? And so P1 here 
is classified as we call the principal um, focus. Okay, principal uh, focus. Or we can even call it the focal point, right? So focal point, principal focus. All right. Okay, great. Now, um, it said the image in figure 6.1 is real and can be focused on a screen. It said, how can you tell from the diagram that the image is real? And so look at the image real quick. I know where the image position is. That's one. And notice the distance away from P as well. All right, so there's a number of things we can talk about it right here. This line is actually taller. This one is shorter. So there's a number of things that we can notice with the image versus the object. And someone give up, uh, let's see, three points. Yeah, I could give a three points for this. And so one, you want to ask us for, it's a two-point mark. Anyhow, yes, good. So one is that light, light, um, so light ray from the object cross the image, right? So light ray um, from the object, that's one of the answer here, object um, cross the image. Okay, so at least one ray will cross the image that make it real. Another answer here is that the image and the object, the image uh, and the object, okay, and the object, all right, are on opposite sides. I mean, opposite sides of the lens, right? On opposite sides. On opposite sides. Let me put sides there. I mean, opposite sides of the lens. So if you want, you could continue with that sentence, right? On opposite sides of the lens. Another possibility here is that the that the object the object is a greater or at a greater distance. The object is greater than at least um, one f, which is um, the focal point, right? Or one p, since the diagram of p is greater than one p. Okay. But usually in the in the in the diagrams they put one f, but again because f represents the focal point or the principal focus. But since they have p in the diagram, let's call it one p. Okay. All right. So here now part two is a state two other properties of the image other than its real. So if we go back onto the diagram here, right? Beside being real, what are the two things you notice? It's upside down. That means it's inverted. Okay. It is shorter than the object, which means it diminish or get smaller. Okay, so let's put those in. So those are two points, but they only ask for one. Okay, so two other properties. Okay, so two other properties. One, um, so it's, it is uh, inverted. That's one. The other one, it is diminished. All right, so those are the two properties. It's diminished, which means getting smaller, and it is inverted. And right, let's go to the next part of the question right here. And this part here now, uh, it said a student carried out an experiment using a lens like the one in figure 6.1. He measured six object and image distances and then recorded the, the magnification and object distance, the results are shown in the table and graph below. All right, so let's go to this. All right, there's no table, there's a graph. All right, so here now we have the object distance here. We have the magnification on this side right here. But let's see what they're asking for this. And here now it said describe the relationship between the object distance and the size of the image. Now let's go back to, to this graph and see what this graph is saying. As you would have noticed that as the distance increases, the magnification is decreasing, right? Or the, or the image is getting smaller. Okay, so let's talk about that. So notice there's an inverse um, relationship taking place right there. So here we can say then as the object distance increases, so let's write in that real quick. Okay, as, as the... Object distance increases. All right. The size or the magnification, the size of my or magnification, the the size, let's put size slash magnification. All right, of the image. 
all right decreased okay all right so that's what's happening here right so again they are inversely related okay so the relationship here let us stick stick a point right here that they are what they are inversely related so they are uh inversely related okay all right great now the next part question is to state the object distance when the size of the object and image are the same size now there's nothing indicating on the graph to say that they are the same size because you're not talking about distance and magnification but there's a little thing you need to remember if 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 an image is the same as the object then its magnification is one you know you use a smartphone right and we use a smartphone and, 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 you, and you take a picture and it said times one times two times ten times one it means i get in the image forming is in terms of ratio the same size right so magnification times one so let's say my magnification times one right here it means the image and the object is the same so they so the distance of the object here is going to be 60 all right so when the object distance is 60 the magnification is times one which means both the object and the image they have the same size magnification times one means the same size image to what object all right, so this is the object distance is going to be 60, and this is 60 what? Millimeters, I think. Yeah, it's in millimeters, right? Okay, so again is when the magnification is times one. So I'm going to put in bracket here, uh, magnification times one. All right, so magnification is times one. That means both are the same. It's a state one practical use of this type of lens, and this is used in a camera. I was even talking about a camera phone, right? Is using a camera, all right. If you get real image in a, in a camera, not necessarily a camera phone because that's digital, but I'm talking about um, regular camera with lens and so on, right? But if if your cell phone have a lens in it, so definitely image will form into the convert only to digital after a while because it's real, it is red, and then convert in the digital sense. All right, this is second to last question, and then we're out of here. All right, so after this question, we do one more, then we're gone. So it said this question is about forces and motion. All right. Figure 7.1 is a is a simplified illustration of the main forces acting on a swimmer and let me put this down back and the wall as she pushes off the wall of a swimming pool. After pushing off the wall, she rises to the surface of the water and swims on the surface. Now, very importantly, we talk about a force right here. Let's let's highlight this force. And so this force is highlighted right here is this, that F. The wall is there, the feet on the wall, all right, and the direction of acceleration. Now, I, I kind of like when they use direction of acceleration because let me put this right here. Do you remember this formula I showed you a little earlier, right? That force equal to mass times acceleration? Yeah, because if there's a force and there's a mass, there is what? Acceleration. All right, great. Now, let's jump into the question here. It said, what law of motion demonstrated by this swimmer as she pushes against the wall so as she pushes against the wall whose law is in play remember if you push on the wall the wall push back on you so therefore it is stating that to every action there is an equal but opposite reaction or if you push on the wall with a certain force the wall push back on you with that same exact force but in opposite direction and this belongs to Newton's third law of motion. So this is Newton's third law, okay, of motion. All right, great. Now, part two is to explain how the law named in part A1 is demonstrated as, this, as she swims on the water surface. Now, what is happening here, right? She's pushing on the wall. So her, her pushing force, um, make, sure, make, make note of that, her pushing force, because she's pushing a force onto the wall, her pushing force is opposite, okay, is opposite to that of the wall. To that of the, of the wall, okay, that's very important. It's opposite that of the wall. And so, uh, because of this, causing now, causing, um, Causing a forward push or causing her to push forward, okay? Causing a forward force or forward motion. So she's going to push forward, 
okay, causing a forward motion on the swimmer. Let's say on the swimmer, right? On the uh, swimmer, okay? All right, very important. All right. So as you swim on the, on the surface, as you push against the wall, the push are forward, okay? Because of equal and opposite what? Forces. Is it how much? No. Let's go back to the question here. It said the swimmer um, whose mass is 60 kg pushes off the wall of the pool with a force of 22 newtons. So if she pushes on the wall with 22 newtons, the wall push her back on with 22 newtons, right? And so how much force is exerted on the swimmer by the wall? The same exact force. So this is 22 newtons because, again, equal and opposite forces. Okay? That's all is happening. It said what is the swimmer's acceleration as she leaves the wall and so first and foremost let's go back to this formula again f we've been using this formula so much on this paper f is equal to mass times acceleration yeah and so you want to find the acceleration then it's going to be force over mass right so if if acceleration here if a is equal to uh force over mass right then we can clearly state that 22 which is or which is a force and our mass here is 60 kg, then our acceleration is 0 0.37. This is meters per second squared. Okay, let me write in my squared. Okay, so this is our acceleration here. All right, great. All right, so let's go down to the next part of the question. All right. It said a swimmer's friend whose mass is greater, she have a greater mass, also pushes off the wall with a force of 22 newtons. Compare the acceleration of the swimmer and her friend. Now, first and foremost, let me just remind of a formula, right? Because the formula is very helpful. So if force is equal to mass times acceleration, right? And if a swimmer mass is greater, a greater mass multiplied by the same, um, by the same acceleration, if you think about it, Let's say the force, because you want to find oh, the acceleration looking for, right? We're comparing acceleration. So if the mass increases for the same force, right? If mass increases for the same force, let's, let's find acceleration as a formula instead of using F is equal to MA. So if A, I want to show you the relationship here. If A equal to F over M, okay? So you'll see it better this way. So if you have a greater mass, so the, if the denominator is greater, then it means that the product will be less, okay? It will be what? less and that's what i want to point out with you so if the mass is smaller if the mass is smaller then it means that then it simply means that it will be what more okay it will be more so 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 the swimmer now has a, has a less mass the friend is a greater mass so the friend will have a, a smaller value of acceleration so for the friend the acceleration will be smaller so smaller or lower acceleration, let's say lower um, acceleration. Let's put ACC there um, for short. I just want to move a little bit faster. And for, for the swimmer now, okay, her um, acceleration is greater. So she has a um, greater um, acceleration and simply because of a lower mass for the same force, right? And based on the formula here. All right, so let's now jump down to the next question here or part of the question. Is a figure 7.2 shows a velocity time graph which depicts the motion of the swimmer friends, the swimmer's friend during the first 15 seconds of in the pool after pushing off the wall. And so let's go into it. Um, let's just analyze the graph a little bit here. Okay, so this is 15 seconds here and she's pushed off the wall. This is actually, um, no, this is velocity on the y-axis. And so velocity against time. And velocity at, against time will give you what? Acceleration, because V over T is acceleration, just to make a note of that. All right? And so it said, describe motion depicts from 0 to 8 second. And, and motion between 0 to 8 second, let's look where 0 to 8 second is. All right? And so we get a good view of that. So 0 to about 8 seconds. And 8 seconds, let's see how much line this is. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So each is, is one. So eight seconds will be here. Okay, so anywhere about here. So from here to here, notice what's happening to motion. The motion is increasing. So there's an increase in velocity over time. And if velocity increases over time, then what you get here is acceleration. So the motion here, it is accelerating and simply because there's an increase in velocity. Okay. So 
acceleration is taking place here. Acceleration, so or the object is accelerating. Okay, let's say accelerating. And it's accelerating because there's an increase in what? Velocity. Okay, so there is an increase velocity with time. Okay, so once velocity increases with time, then yes, that's acceleration. Now let's look at the 8 to 15 seconds. So starting from 8 to 15 seconds, you're going down. That means there's a decrease in speed. There's a decrease in velocity over time, which means it is decelerating. Okay, so the motion here is decelerating. So let's put it right here. Again, decelerating. Okay, and this is because there is a decrease in velocity. So decrease velocity. All right, with time. Okay, velocity with time. Okay, all right, great. All right, so let's go to the next part of the question right here now. And this seems like the last part, right? Is it give a reason for the motion of a swimmer's friend between 8 and 15 seconds compared to 0 0.02 and 8 seconds? So 8 to 15 is when she's decelerating, right? That means there's a decrease in velocity. That means acceleration is getting less. So if it's decreasing, it therefore means because a decrease in force. Because remember now, it's the force that causes her to accelerate. So if motion is decreasing, it's simply because that force is also what decreasing. So guess what? The pushing force, or pushing force is decreased. Or pushing force, because remember it's the wall that's causing this, right? Or pushing force, or even because she's swimming or thrusting through the water. So a pushing force um, decreases. Okay? That's exactly what is happening. All right? So a pushing force decreases. Um, between, uh oh, first decreases um, between um, 8 and 15 seconds. And let's put that to short, 8 and 15 seconds. All right, great. So that's the end of that question. Now we're on the last question. I know you couldn't wait. All right, yep. All right, so this one said this question is about atomic particles, all right, and radioactivity. And here it states now that um, name the type of radioactive decay that is most um, ionizing. So the most ionizing um, particle right here is our alpha particles, okay? So it's alpha particles. They are the most ionizing ones. All right. Now, for part B now, it said an atom of radium, which is Ra, of mass 226 and an atomic number of 88 decays by alpha emission so decay by alpha emission emission which means it break down by releasing alpha particles emitting mean gives off and it produces um here radon okay and it's a write the nuclear reaction for this decay in the space provided all right let's say you start this examination right and you do not know, you do not understand chemistry really and or you forget the atomic numbers all right it's not a worry to be honest with you so what you're going to do first and foremost here is to write out something here because you start out with with radium so matter of fact let me write these in you're going to start out with radium so you're going to say ra right here you start out with radium okay and so this is ra now, what I wanted to note is that the mass number, let's put the mass number on the top and the atomic number at the bottom. Atomic number is the same thing as the number of protons, by the way, okay? Just to make a note of that. So, we're going to say 2, 2, and 6 as the mass number here for um, radium. And then we'll put the atomic number here, which is going to be 8, okay? And 8, right? And this is decaying, so we're going to break down. Okay, so you're going to break down by emitting or giving off alpha particles. And just to make a note there, that alpha particles, just the symbol right there, as a mass of four and a proton number of two. Okay, so I'm putting the proton number of two. Okay, so when this gives off, you give off Rn. But let's say you do not know the, the atomic number, neither do you know the mass number for radon. Okay, so what you're going to do now, you're going to plus the alpha particle, which is... Um, a mass number of four, okay, and a proton number or atomic number of two. Now, let's look at this in our logics, right? Now, remember now, 
by means of chemical equation, the reactant must equal to the product in terms of particles, mass, and so on, because the mass is conserved, okay? So if the mass is started out with 226, the total mass, the total mass on the product side must be 226 as well. If it started out with the atomic number of 88, then the total atomic number on the product side must also be 88. So we're going to make this work out now. To, make, to find out the figure out the mass number for radon, we're now going to minus the 4 from the 226, correct? So this is now going to give us 2, 2, and 2. Now to figure out the proton number here, or the atomic number for radon, we're going to minus the 2 from the 88. So this here will give us our 86, right? And so that will be the balance, the chemical equation there, right? For the decaying of radium into radon by an alpha particle. Okay? All right, so we are finished with that. Now, that's a two mark question there. All right, so now jump to the next question here. It's a sample of iodine, which is 128, has a half life of 25 seconds. Now, this is something serious. Now, 25 seconds is the half life, which means what this means, right? That means for every time this 128 breaks down to half, or half of every piece that is remaining, it takes 25 minutes to break down, right? Now, the part here says define the term half life. So let's define half life. So let me just highlight this iodine 128, which means 120 is the mass number, by the way. Okay. So now let's talk about what is um, half life. So half life now means that the time taken, the time taken for half, okay, for half uh, the nucleus of the substance, of the nucleus, nucleus or the mass, okay, or the particles if you want to say, mass, particles, mass, anything you want to say, that's not a problem. Um, mass, uh, so the time taken for half the nucleus or mass um, of the substance to decay, of the substance, okay, to decay or disintegrate, to decay, break down or disintegrate, whichever one you want to write, not a problem, okay, to break down or disintegrate. All right, great. Now, um, let's go to the next part of the question right here now. Next part said that now, the sample of iodine 128, again, 128 is the mass number, right? Um, as a mass of 18 kilograms, estimate how long it, estimate how much of it is left in grams after 1.5 hours have passed. So what time are we working here with? 1.5 hours. The half-life again, 25 minutes. What mass we starting out with? 1.4 kilograms. Again, the half-life is 25 what? Minutes. So let's go back to show you clarification right here. 25 minutes is the half-life. So we're going to start out with 1.4 kilograms. We're going to continue until 1.5 hours. And then we're going to estimate. And they, they, they have a right to put the word estimate right here. Because the difficulty in calculation right here, because 25 minutes, if you go half by half, you don't give you 1.5. But estimate is a good word, eh? So that's a smart thing. You don't have to be exact, but I want to be exact as I possibly can do, right? To so, see uh, how I get this. Now, uh, let's break this down. Uh oh, there's one thing to point out right here. They want us to do this in grams. Woo! So we're going to do this in grams. So to do this in grams, the first thing is to is to convert the kilograms into grams then to make life easier, right? You don't want to go at the last and then convert the grams. You could do it firstly. So let's do it right now. So we're going to change the 1.4 kg into grams. So we're going to be 1,400 grams. Okay, let's start with that. We're going to break this down in its first half-life or the first half, which is going to be 700 uh, because half of 1,400 is 700, right? And remember it took... 25 minutes to do this. So let's put 25 minutes right here, right? 25 minutes it took to do this. Let's put, so you don't get confused. To so break it down from 1,400 to 700, that is 25 minutes, right? And then now to move from 700, which is half of 700, will give us 350, right? This is going to be 350. And the time taken to break it down again is another 25 minutes. All right. But let's, that's only 50 minutes, right? But um, one and a half hour, 1.5 hours, that's the same thing as 90 minutes, right? So I want to go up to 90 minutes, okay? So now let's continue with another half-life here, okay? Another half-life. And so 350 divided by 2, which is half, which give you 17, no, 175. 
And so this another 25 minutes right here, because each time it breaks down is 25 minutes to do it. Okay. But this is only what? 75 um, minutes now, but we want to go up to one up to 90 minutes, because one and a half hour is 90 minutes. And so if we put another 25 here, that will be 100 minutes. That is way that is over. Not say way over, but really over 90 minutes by 10 minutes, right? So even if we go to one more half life, that's close to the number because 90 minutes versus um, 100 minutes is really close. So it could be that's the estimated value. So I could do two things here, but I want to record exact value right here. I'm not sure what I'm going to do. To get the exact value, how many more minutes do you need to, uh, to get this? Let me make this a little longer. How many more minutes do you need to get to 90? This is 75 already, right? So you need 15 more minutes now, right? So 15 more minutes is required right here. What will happen in 15 minutes? How much more will we get? Now, we have a problem. No, not necessarily a problem, but hey, well, let's find the ratio between, let's use in, 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 in pencil. We want to find the ratio between 15 and 25, right? To see how much 15 will break it down. So 15, if 25 go half, then 15 must go less than half, right? So we're going to get a ratio between 25 and 15. So 15 divided by 25 here, you get 0 0.6, right? This is 0 0.6. But what 0 0.6 is telling you, that the substance will break down less than half, which is only 0 0.3, uh, let's say 0 0.4. So 0 0.4 of it will break down, not 0 0.5, because 0 0.5 is half the time, right? So how will it break down by? By 15, by 15 um, minutes, we'll only break down 0 0.45 of it. So what is left is 0 0.45. So I want to find the 0.6% the, the of this. You can think about this as percentage too, right? So this is 60% of this, right? is left 60 percent of it is left because 40 percent will be what decayed so let's look at both um so we're gonna multiply one um 175 by 0 0.6 so if we should multiply 175 by 6 okay by 0 0.6 i should say a matter of fact by 0 0.6 okay then we should end up here with uh 105 yep 105 okay so 15 minutes will change 175 to 105. Let's put it back here. So what we'll get here is 105. So our, our estimated amount, unless it will be one, one, 105 grams, a matter of fact, right? So the estimated value or the estimated amount that will remain here is 105. I could, it's not a different color as well, right? So this will be our answer in red. All right. Awesome. All right, so our estimated that is left in grams is 105. Now, go to the next question right here. It said, what would, it said, why would iodine-128 be suitable as a medical tracer? If something breaks down in 25 minutes to half its time, imagine a day, imagine two days, imagine a, a whole month, almost nothing will left, right? So it has a very short half life in, in bottom line, right? Bottom line of a very short half life. So it, it, it has um, a short half life. Okay. In other words, it can disintegrate easily. Okay. It um, disintegrate easily. Uh, okay. Uh oh, what I was writing. So this integrate easily okay all right so that's that's what it, or you can say it break down easily i must give an extra option you could break down easy so anything of that um, effect is good it breaks down easy disintegrate easily after a long period of time there'll be not li little to nothing left things like that okay so break down real easily okay so all of those answer um you can have right there okay all right so that's that for that one more question this is the last part. It's a carbon dating is another use of radioactive isotopes. Define isotope and state the isotope of carbon that is used for this purpose, for carbon dating, that is. All right? So what are isotopes? Isotopes now, um, the isotopes are elements. It's the isotopes. I'm going to put this in a singular um, term. So isotope is an element that is an element right with different with different mass numbers 
due to a difference due to a difference in the number of neutrons okay the number of neutrons so that's what causes it to change because the neutron number changes then the mass number changes and to answer the next part of the question the isotope of carbon that is used for carbon dating is called carbon 14 so this right written as this carbon 14 which means 14 is the mass number of carbon for this case remember that the normal mass number of a carbon is 12 right so the different mass number here will be 14 because of different in number of neutrons all right and this is where we end for today and so good luck on the examination do well rest well we we'll see you again shortly